Section One of Nature and Art, Volume Eight, Number One, June nineteen hundred. Recorded for LibriVox.org. Alone with Nature. Alone with Nature, I love to roam, midst forest shades, over meadows green where the soft winds blow neath the azure dome and only the works of god are seen away away from the city's din long murmuring brooks by placid ponds far from the sight of human sin and moral weakness in satan's bonds away away neath the towering trees where the thrush pours forth his wildwood song, and the gray squirrel nimbly leaps with ease from branch to branch of the maple strong, where the hornets build their marvelous nest and hang it high from human foe, where the blackbird neath her soft warm breast shelters her young when the storm winds blow where the tortoise gravely stalks along like sage of old in sombre thought and the great horned owl in utterance strong bemoans the changes time has wrought along the hillsides facing south where the earliest wild flowers may be found where the big bullfrog with cavernous mouth welcomes spring from the marshy ground where the red wing swinging among the reeds saucily sings he can't come here where the cunning rail bird yearly breeds and raises her brood with little fear on the banks of streams to lie and watch the gambols of the fish while the pond turtles lazily bask near by in indolent freedom from care or wish thus with nature to commune and to note her creatures gay while mind and heart are in a tune with creation's work from day to day f alex lucas end of section one section two of nature and art volume eight number one june nineteen hundred this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. Flowers. A pattern flower. John M. Coulter. Flowers are of very many patterns, and it must not be supposed that there is any special pattern for them all. There are four parts which belong to flowers in general, and they are repeated in various flowers in numberless ways, or one or more of the parts may be omitted. The flower of the common wild lily, chosen for our illustration, is highly organized, with all the parts represented and well developed. Each part is constructed for some definite work which we may or may not fully understand. The flower of the illustration shows on the outside six leaf-like bodies, colored a deep orange or reddish, and bearing dark spots. These six bodies are in two sets of three, an outer and an inner set. When there are two sets of these leaf-like bodies, the outer set is called the calyx, and the inner one the corolla. The three leaves of the calyx are called sepals, and the three leaves of the corolla, petals. In this case the sepals and petals look alike, and then it is usual to speak of the whole set of six as the perianth. In many flowers, however, the sepals and petals do not look at all alike. In the common wake-robin or trillium, a near relative of the lily, the three sepals are like ordinary small green leaves, while the petals are much larger and showy, giving the characteristic color to the flower. In the lily, it should be further noticed that the sepals and petals are all separate, but in many flowers 
they are united in various ways to form urns tubes funnels trumpets etc the common morning glory is an illustration of a flower in which the petals are united so as to form a beautiful trumpet shaped or funnel form corolla the general purpose of the perianth that is the two outer parts of the flower is to protect the far more important inner parts in the bud and when the flower opens the perianth unfolds and exposes the inner parts which are then ready for their peculiar work the bright color usually shown by the corolla and sometimes also by the calyx as in the lily is probably associated with the visits of insects which come to the flower for nectar or other food since it has been found however that some visiting insects are color-blind it is doubtful whether the color is so universal an attraction as it was once thought to be but it is certainly associated with some sort of important work a summary of these various duties is as follows the green leaf-like calyx is certainly for bud protection the brightly colored corolla and sometimes calyx adds to the duty of protection that of attracting necessary insects or some other duty that we do not as yet understand just within the corolla the third part or set appears consisting of six stamens these six stamens are also in two sets of three each an outer and an inner one each stamen consists of a long stalk-like part called the filament and at the summit of the filament is borne the anther which in the lily consists of two long narrow pouches lying side by side when the anther is ripe these pouches are filled with a yellow powdery dust called the pollen each particle of the dust-like pollen consists of a minute but beautifully organized globular body known as the pollen grain the anther pouches are therefore full of pollen grains in the lily it will be noticed that when the anthers are ripe and the pollen is ready to be shed a slit opens lengthwise in each of the two pouches or sacs this is the common method for opening the anther sacs but in some flowers it is curiously modified for example in the heaths such as the huckleberry the sacs open by a hole at the end and sometimes the tips of the sacs are drawn out into long hollow tubes through which the pollen is discharged in other cases as in the sassafras the sacs open by little trap doors which swing open as if upon hinges of the two parts of the stamen the filament and anther the latter is the essential one so that in some cases the filament may be lacking entirely only the anther appearing to represent the stamen furthermore the essential thing about the anther is the pollen to manufacture which is the sole purpose of the stamen the pollen is necessary to enable the flower to produce seeds but it must be transferred from the anther which produces it to the fourth part of the flower not yet described in which the seeds are formed this transfer of pollen is known as pollination and the transfer is usually effected in one of two ways by the wind or by insects as a rule also the pollen made by one flower must be transferred to some other flower to do its work and sometimes the other flower may be at a considerable distance if the pollen is to be transferred by the wind it must be very light and dry and it must also be very abundant for the wind is a chance carrier and drops the pollen everywhere in a very wasteful fashion in such a case the pollen must come down like rain to be sure that some of it strikes the right spot on the right flowers occasionally one hears in the papers of showers of sulphur which always prove to be showers of pollen carried by the wind from some forest chiefly evergreen forests and dropped at random 
in the case of pines the minute pollen grains develop wings to assist in the wind transportation if the pollen is to be transferred by insects it does not need to be so dry and powdery or so abundant as in the other case for the insect passes directly from one flower to another without any random scattering of the pollen only winged insects are used for this purpose as those which must creep or rather walk would brush the pollen from their bodies by rubbing against the various obstructions in the way the insects most commonly used are the numerous kinds of bees wasps butterflies and moths these insects visit the flowers for different purposes the butterflies and moths are after the nectar while the bees and wasps feed upon the pollen visiting insects are therefore often grouped as nectar feeders and pollen feeders but in either case they are instrumental in transferring the pollen the fourth or innermost part of the lily flower is an organ called the pistil it stands in the center of the flower and is composed of three distinct regions at the base it is bulbous and hollow containing the bodies which are to become seeds this bulbous region is called the ovary and the little bodies it contains which through the action of the pollen are to become seeds are called ovules rising from the top of the ovary is a slender stalk-like part called the style and at the top of the style is a knob-like region called the stigma the most essential region of the pistil is the ovary for it contains the ovules next in importance is the stigma for it must receive the pollen grains the style is of least importance and therefore is sometimes wanting the stigma being directly upon the ovary the duty of the style when it is present seems to be to put the stigma into a favorable position to receive the pollen it must not be supposed that the stigma always resembles a knob-like top to the style it is really only a surface prepared to receive pollen so it may be upon the top of the style or may run like a line down one side of it or may display itself in some other way the pistil of the lily however is not a single structure if the ovary be cut across it will be found to be made up of three compartments each one of which contains ovules each one of these compartments represents a unit of structure which has entered into the formation of the pistil these units are called carpels and the pistil of the lily is made up of three carpels in this case the three are distinct only in the ovary and have completely lost their identity in the region of the style in many relatives of the lily however the three carpels are kept distinct in the style region three styles or a three-parted style appearing upon the ovary in some flowers the carpels are kept entirely distinct each one having its own ovary style and stigma for example in the buttercup there is a little mound in the center of the flower made up of numerous pistils each consisting of a single carpel it is evident therefore that a pistil may consist of one carpel or several carpels and that in the latter case the carpels may be more or less completely united the sure indication of a carpel is that each carpel bears its own ovules in some flowers there is but a single carpel as in peas and beans whose pods have developed from a pistil consisting of a single carpel as is indicated by the single lengthwise set of seeds in some plants the flowers do not have all the four parts described above in some cases the petals may be lacking the one set of perianth parts represented being regarded as the calyx although it may look like a corolla as in the clematis or anemone such flowers are said to be apetalous which means without petals in other cases both the calyx and corolla may be wanting the flower consisting of only stamens and carpels such flowers are spoken of as naked 
in other flowers the stamens may be lacking and the pistil is the only essential part present such flowers are said to be pistillate it may be counted upon however that if there are pistillate flowers there are also corresponding staminate flowers in which the pistils are lacking and the stamens present in such cases both staminate and pistillate flowers may occur on the same plant or they may occur on different plants so that there may be not only staminate and pistillate flowers but also staminate and pistillate plants it also sometimes happens that staminate and pistillate flowers are also naked so that in such cases the flower is represented by stamens alone or even by a single stamen or by carpels alone or by a single carpel it would be hard to imagine a more simple flower than one composed of a single stamen or a single carpel such flowers may be found in the willows in this study of the lily it should be observed that the number three runs through all the parts of the flower the flower formula may be expressed as follows sepals three petals three stamens three plus three carpels three this number is established in many families related to the lilies and is one of their characteristic features in other groups of flowering plants a different number is established the number five being the most common for example, in the common wild geranium, the flower formula is as follows. Sepals 5, petals 5, stamens 5 plus 5, carpels 5. In still other flowers, the number 4 is established. In many common flowers, it will be noticed that no definite number is established or that it is not completely established. For example, in the common wild rose, there are 5 sepals and 5 petals, but an indefinite number of stamens and carpels while in the water lily there is no definite number established the sepals being usually four and the other parts indefinitely repeated in those flowers in which some number is definitely established it often happens that one set may be reduced in number and this is usually the carpel set in the families of highest rank among flowering plants such as the figworts mints and composites sunflowers asters dandelions etc the flower formula is sepals five petals five stamens five and carpels two another fact shown by the lily flower is that the different sets alternate with each other in position the three petals do not stand directly in front of the three sepals but in front of the spaces between the sepals in the same way the three outer stamens alternate with the petals the inner stamens alternate with the outer ones and the three carpels alternate with the inner set of stamens it is very uncommon to find one set standing directly in front of the next outer set and this position opposite the other set always needs some special explanation as a rule therefore the flower sets alternate with one another but in some cases a set may be opposite the history of a flower does not end with the opening of the blossom if the stigma has succeeded in receiving some pollen and the pollen has succeeded in doing its work the ovules within the ovary become gradually transformed into seeds and the ovary becomes transformed into the fruit the outer sets of the flower usually disappearing in the lily these fruits take the form of dry pods some of which may be seen in the illustration such pods have various ways of opening to discharge their ripened seeds in many cases the commonly recognized fruit includes more than the ovary for example in the apple and pear the modified ovary is represented by what is called the core and the pulpy part outside forming the edible part of the fruit is the thickened calyx in the strawberry the real fruits are the small nut-like pits which are more or less embedded in the surface 
while the pulpy part is the very much enlarged and fleshy tip of the stem which bore the numerous carpels in the pineapple the change involves a whole flower cluster and a pineapple is a cluster of flowers which has formed a pulpy mass flowers leaves stems and all from what has been said it will be noticed that some fruits ripen dry as in the case of the lily pod bean pod etc and that others ripen fleshy as in the case of apples strawberries etc it must not be supposed that flesh can only be formed by parts outside of the ovary for the peach is a modified ovary whose wall has separated into two layers the outer of which forms the pulp and the inner the stone the kernel within the stone being the real seed whatever form or structure the fruit may take everything is with reference to the dispersal of the seeds which must be carried to places suitable for their germination how seeds are carried about is a long story which must be deferred to some later time but it belongs to the general subject of flowers it will be seen from the above brief account that flowers occur in almost infinite variety so that we are able to tell the various groups of flowering plants by the kind of flowers they produce amidst all of this infinite variety however there are but two purposes shown the variety being merely the different ways in which different plants have carried them out these two purposes are the securing of pollination in order that seeds may be formed and the proper distribution of the seeds all structures found in flowers should be made to answer these two problems End of section 2section three of nature and art volume eight number one june nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by betty b god's handiwork john wesley waite how beauteous every shade on spring's awakened trees how perfect the colors laid by his most kind decrees end of section three this recording is in the public domain Section 4 of Nature and Art, Volume 8, Number 1, June 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. Birds. Natural Rights of Birds. Linz Jones. What do we mean by a natural right? are there rights of any other sort in the world yes a legal right may not always be a natural right on the contrary a legal right is sometimes a natural wrong in many states it has at one time or another been legally right to slaughter the hawks and owls which are far more useful than harmful the birds had a clear title to the natural right of life which the laws denied until the lawmakers discovered their mistake long ago our forefathers declared that all men possess the natural right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness certainly no one will deny that any creature has a right to life so long as in its life it contributes more towards the welfare of the world than in its death it also has a right to liberty so long as it can do more good at liberty than as a captive granting that the lower animals are capable of happiness no one would think of denying them the right of the pursuit of their happiness except for some higher good without discussing these general principles further let us see how they will apply to the birds as natural rights has the bird a right to live according to our first principle he has if he is more useful alive than dead what then does he do that can be called really useful if he is a diver a gull a tern or any one of the really seafaring birds he eats fish water insects offal 
and whatever small animals resort to the water doing little or no harm and a great deal of good near large seacoast cities the gulls dispose of the garbage which is taken out a distance from shore and dumped into the ocean and so prevent its drifting back upon the beach if he is a duck goose or swan he feeds upon fish the plants which grow in the water and at its margins upon the insects and worms which inhabit the ooze at the bottom and sometimes upon grains in the fields and about the marshes he does a great deal of good and rarely any harm if he is a heron crane rail coot or gallinule his food is frogs snakes insects and worms and so he is useful if he is a snipe sandpiper or plover he destroys large numbers of insects worms and such small animals as are to be found in wet places and is always a very useful help to the farmer if he is a bird of the fowl kind or a pigeon he eats grain mostly but also many insects he may sometimes do a little damage to the ripe grain but he usually gathers that which has gone to waste if he is a vulture hawk eagle or owl he destroys great quantities of animals that are harmful to man not often visiting the poultry yard and so does great good if he is a kingfisher he eats small fish mostly and so is not harmful among all the remaining birds there are but a few which do not feed almost entirely upon insects or other creatures which menace vegetation even these seed eaters feed the young upon insects and worms and do good by destroying vast quantities of injurious plants those which eat ripe fruit pay for what they eat by scattering broadcast the seeds of the fruit when there is no ripe fruit they eat insects and worms the crows and blackbirds and bobolink are rather overly fond of green corn and ripe grains in the fall of the year but they pay for what they eat by destroying immense quantities of insects and worms in the spring when the whole life of the bird is taken into account we cannot escape the fact that the bird has a natural right to life on account of the good he does how does the value of the bird's body used for food compare with the good the bird would do if allowed to live reckoned in dollars and cents the flesh on an average bird's body would be worth say twenty-five cents at the price of good beef but let us say seventy-five cents to do full justice to the greater excellence of the bird's flesh as food we must consider however that the most of the birds which are not good for food civilized food are among our largest birds the size of the average edible bird would therefore be greatly reduced so our estimate is a very liberal one but during the average lifetime of the average bird it would destroy many times its own weight of injurious animals careful investigations have shown that these injurious animals would do many times more damage than the worth of the bird's flesh we have no need then to take into account the real good we derive in the pleasure which the beautiful plumage the sweet voice and the graceful form bring to us that is an added value which nothing can compensate for how does the value of the bird's skin as an ornament of dress or of the dwelling or as a scientific specimen compare with its value as a living creature as an ornament it may be a thing of beauty or a hideous caricature even as a thing of beauty it could not be made more so than the living bird 
no one will be willing to declare that the quill or the wing or the skin is necessary to the bonnet many of us honestly think that the bonnet would look far better without either as a scientific specimen the skin will serve some purposes some legitimate purposes which the living bird will not the living bird cannot be fully understood without a careful study of its structure any more than a living man can unfortunately birds which die a natural death cannot be found while their bodies are fit to study if found at all but happily the number of dead birds necessary for study is limited even for scientific purposes there is no possible excuse for indiscriminate slaughter collecting should be left to those and those only who know what is needed and are content with enough in these days of large collections and advanced knowledge it is the rare exception when the dead bird will be more useful than the living one these exceptions do not affect the right of the bird to live boys who begin to study birds have a passion for making a collection of the eggs eggs are beautiful things and they look well in a cabinet properly arranged but all of the eggs which most boys would be likely to find are already well known so that a study of the eggs in the nest and of the young birds will teach him far more that we really need to know about the birds the greater good is not to make a collection of birds eggs what shall we say about the bird's right to liberty clearly the bird at liberty to perform the part which nature intended for him can fully accomplish that part only when at liberty to go his own way but it would be idle to declare that the caged bird is in no wise useful to the world there are some things which can be learned about birds only from caged ones if a bird be caged for the purpose of learning these things the very few that will be needed for this purpose will be fulfilling a high good and if given their freedom again when the lessons have been learned the harm if there be any will be fully repaid but here again the caged bird will be the rare exception and so does not affect the right of the average bird to liberty we then have only to inquire whether the bird has a right to the pursuit of happiness no one who has studied the living bird with anything like an appreciation of it will think of denying that birds are creatures of intense life capable of strong feeling and keen enjoyment they speak out their feelings in song and action it is really their human attributes which makes them appeal so strongly to us we know that they are capable of love and hate of joy and sorrow of pleasure and pain in them we recognize the heroic attribute of martyrdom in order therefore to determine what the attitude of the bird would likely be were his right to the pursuit of happiness denied we have only to ask what our own attitude would be under the same circumstances if our happiness should be threatened in this place we would certainly go where it would not be the birds do the same but we have already seen that the birds have a right to life and liberty on account of the services they render to the world if we deny them the right of happiness they will not be able to perform their service for us under persecution they cannot do their best even if they remain to do anything for us persistent persecution will either drive them away or destroy them altogether since we cannot do without their services even for a single year it is clear that we must agree that they do have the natural right to the pursuit of happiness 
we are ready then to concede to the birds as natural rights what we long ago declared were the natural rights of mankind life liberty and the pursuit of happiness we might properly discuss the question what do we owe to the birds but that is a separate topic for a later time end of section four section five of nature and art volume eight number one june nineteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Structure and Habits of Birds From a Lecture by Frank M. Chapman, April 1900 How have the various types of bird life come into existence? To understand this, we must study the wings of the creature to learn its evolution from the early reptile-like type of bird. The most primitive use of the wing is as a hand, by which the bird may climb about. In contrast, the albatross has the finest developed wings of any species, which are fourteen feet across. The man o' war, however, is even a better example, perhaps, for although having a body no larger than a hen, it has wings which spread apart to a distance of seven or eight feet enabling it to soar in the air for several days without touching the earth by intertwining the outer feathers of the wings some birds can remain stationary in the air for hours at a time not once moving a wing the razor-billed hawk is the nearest living representative of the extinct great hawk a bird which having small wings could not fly and soon became extinct the penguin with its flippers can fly only on the water and has to waddle when on land certain grebes which find their food in lakes have also lost their power of flight this is true of some pigeons auks parrots grebes ducks and other birds which have not found it necessary to obtain their food by flying wings are also used to express emotion many young birds of which the oriole furnishes an example cause their wings to quaver in supplication certain birds also make use of their wings as a musical organ as is evinced in the whistling sound produced by the woodcock our nighthawk makes a booming sound with its wings by extending its outer quills as it dives earthward a weapon is also found by some birds in their wings the pigeon hen and other of our common birds using their wings to strike with the foot shares with the wing the duties of locomotion birds with highly developed wings have poor feet the swallow an aerial bird is an example the chimney swift has a tiny foot but enormously developed wings and if placed on a flat surface is unable even to support itself all aquatic and terrestrial birds have excellently developed feet the loon is so thoroughly aquatic that it cannot walk on land without the support of its breast and wings the sea snipe has a foot especially fitted for swimming and can be found a few hundred miles off the atlantic coast in flocks of hundreds of thousands perfectly at home in the water the foot is generally related to the length of the neck the flamingo wades out into the water and is able to duck its head and secure its food with the aid of its particularly constructed neck in securing prey the foot also plays an important part the great horned owl and the duck hawk have enormous grasping power in their claws in our grouse or partridge a horny fringe-like growth appears on the toes late in the fall serving as a sort of snowshoe during the winter by which the bird is enabled to walk on the surface of the snow this growth is shed in the spring the bill is the most important organ of the four we are discussing it has the offices of the hand 
there is an almost limitless variation in its shape admirably adapted in each instance to its food requirements the fish-eating duck grasps its prey with a saw bill the pelican catches its fish by diving from the air often from distances of forty feet and catches its fish in a bill an inch and a half in width as it throws its head out in diving it widens the rim of its bill and catches the prey in its curious pouch the flamingo catches with its food mud and sand which it expels through a curious straining apparatus the woodcock has the power of curving up the upper portion of its bill giving it the grasping power of a finger which greatly aids it in probing for worms the woodpecker uses its bill as a chisel in southern arizona the californian woodpeckers have used the poles of the western union telegraph company in which to store acorns and in some instances have bored large holes entirely through the poles in those woodpeckers which feed on bark we find the tongue brush-like to swab up the sap where woodpeckers chisel the tongue is horny in prying off cones from trees the crossbill finds its apparently malformed tongue most helpful in hummingbirds there is a marked variation in the bill enabling them to feed on different sorts of flowers the hewer bird of new zealand has the most curious bill known the male has one sort which he uses in excavating after which the female can insert her bill and secure the food which the male has thus obtained after a study of the various forms of bird structure and habits has been made it still remains a problem whether their structure is the result of natural selection or natural selection is the result of their structure end of section five Section 6 of Nature and Art, Volume 8, Number 1, June 1900, recorded for LibriVox.org. Wilson's Thrush, Tyrodus fuscescens. This very interesting bird is found in all parts of eastern North America, breeds in the states bordering on the Great Lakes, and as far north as Manitoba. It winters in Central America. It is generally partial to low, swampy woodlands. He is much more shy than his pretty cousin, the wood thrush. He lives nearer the ground and is not so likely to leave the cover of his haunts. In localities where he is equally common with the wood thrush, he is less frequently observed. The nest of this thrush is made of strips of bark, rootlets, and leaf stems wrapped with leaves and lined with fine rootlets. The nest is always on or near the ground. Mr. Chapman says of him, he has a double personality, or he may repeat the notes of some less vocally developed ancestor, for on occasions he gives utterance to an entirely uncharacteristic series of cacking notes, and even mounts high in the tree to sing a hesitating medley of the same unmusical cacks, broken, whistled calls, and attempted trills. Fortunately, this performance is comparatively uncommon, and to the most of us he is known only by his own strange, unearthly song. His notes touch chords which no other bird's song reaches. The water thrush is inspiring. The wood and hermit thrushes serenely exalt the spirit. But Wilson's thrush, or the Veery, appeals to higher feelings. All the wondrous mysteries of the wood find a voice in his song. He thrills us with emotions we cannot express. End of section 6. This recording is in the public domain. Section 7 of Nature and Art volume eight number one june nineteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b fishes the fishes place in nature 
david star jordan some animals have their hard parts on the outside these may be a horny coat or skin such as the beetle has or a double shell like the oysters or a single shell like the house of a snail or they may be a hard crust like the lobster's coat of mail or a brittle crust like the sea urchins or with tough nodules on a leathery hide as in the starfish or any one of a hundred variations from these but in all such cases there is no backbone no true skeleton and no real skull then there are a host of animals that have their hard parts on the inside when this is the case the animal has a regular head generally with a skull inside to protect a brain from hard knocks then behind the skull is a backbone made up of a number of separate joints of bone to the skeleton other bones are attached to help the animal to move himself about on land or in the water sometimes these bones grow out as legs with toes and claws at the tip of them sometimes they take the form of wings or they may spread out into flat paddles or oars of one kind or another and these we call fins what shape the parts take depends on what the animal does with them for every kind of beast is built with direct reference to his business in life the back-boned animals are the highest of all the animal kingdom that is in general they can do more things they have a greater variety of relations to the things around them and they are more definitely fitted for a high position some of them are not very high nor very intelligent even as compared with their lower brethren the insects the ant is a tiny creature with no skull and no backbone and cannot do any very big thing but she is a very wise beast by the side of a carp or a herring still on the whole the backboned animals are the highest and as you and i both belong to that class we could never afford to confess to any doubts as to their superiority but we are the highest of the type that is we men and the rest of the tribe are all lower and the lowest of all backboned animals we call fishes and we shall know a fish when we see one because the hard parts or skeletons are on the inside and he stays in the water breathing the air which is dissolved in it and he has never any toes or claws or feathers he breathes with gills and he swims with fins he has no hair or feathers on his body and when he has any cover on his skin at all it takes the shape of scales a fish is a water backboned animal a backboned animal is called a vertebrate a fish is therefore a water vertebrate there were fishes before there were any other kind of vertebrates they have been on the earth longer than birds or beasts or reptiles they came first and we have good reason to believe that the fishes are the ancestors of all the others but when the forefathers of the land animals found means of keeping alive on the land so many new opportunities opened out to them and they found so much variety in their surroundings that they throve and spread amazingly and there came to be many kinds of them of many forms while the rest of the tribe kept in the water and stayed fishes and there was always a host of these and nearly all of them had fishes for their food so they fought for food and fought for place those who could swim fastest got away from the rest and those who could move quickest got the most to eat those with the longest teeth were present at the most meals and those with the biggest mouths dined with them and some escaped because they had hard bony scales too tough to crack some were covered over with thorns and some had spines in their fins which they set erect when their enemies would swallow them and some had poison in their spines and benumbed their enemies and some gave them electric shocks some hid in crevices of rock or bored holes in the mud and lay there with their noses and their beady eyes peeping out some crawled into dead shells some stretched their slim ribbon-like bodies out in the hanging seaweed some fled into caves whither no one followed them and where they lay hid for a whole geological age until seeing nothing they had all gone blind and some went down into the depths of the sea two miles three miles five miles i have helped haul them up to the light and these went blind like the others for the depths of the sea are black as ink and cold as ice 
and even there they are not safe for other fishes go down there to eat them and some carry lanterns large shining spots on their heads or bodies sometimes like the headlight of an engine and with these flashing lanterns these burglars of the deep hunt their prey and these are hunted by others fish hungry too who lurk in the dark and swallow them lanterns headlight and all and so with all this eating and chasing and fighting and fleeing and hiding and lurking it comes about that wherever there is decent water on land or sea there are fishes to match it and every part of every fish is made expressly for the life the fish has to lead if any kind failed to meet requirements other fishes would devour and destroy it so only the fit can survive and these people the water after their kind all kinds of fishes are good to eat except a few which are too tough a few which are bitter and a few that feed on poisonous things about the coral reefs and so become poisonous themselves some are stupid some full of small bones and some are too lean or too small to tempt anybody unless it be another fish but this is their business not ours and they have flesh enough for the things they have to do the biggest fish is the great basking shark which grows to be thirty-five feet long and lies on the surface of the sea like a huge saw log filling its great mouth with the little things that float along beside it the smallest of all fishes lives in the everglades of florida and the streams that run out of them you can find them in the little brook that runs through jacksonville i have netted them there with a spread umbrella which will serve when you cannot get a better dip net they are pretty barred with jet black on a greenish ground and they belong to that group of top minnows to which agassiz gave the name of heterorondia it is hard to say what is the highest fish what is the one which has undergone the greatest modification of structure perhaps this place should be assigned to the soul with its two eyes both on one side of the head peering through the same socket while the socket on the other side has no eye at all or perhaps we may place as highest some specialized form as the angler or the sargassum fish which has the paired fins greatly developed almost like arms and legs and which has a dorsal spine modified into a fishing rod which has a bait at the end hanging over the capacious mouth agassiz put the sharks higher than all these bony fishes because while lower in most respects the sharks have greater brain and greater power of muscle others again might give the highest place to the lung fishes fishes of the tropical swamps with lungs as well as gills and which can breathe air after a fashion when the water is all gone these are not high in themselves but they are nearest the higher animals especially interesting to us because from such creatures in the past all the frogs and salamanders and through these all the beasts that bite the birds that fly and the reptiles that crawl are descended these are near the primitive fish stock the ancestors of true fishes on the one hand and of the land vertebrates on the other as such they partake of the nature of both more correctly their descendants have divided their characters their land progeny lost the gills scales and fins of the lung fishes while their water descendants have lost their lungs or rather the use of them for the lung of the fish is generally a closed sac called the air bladder sometimes it is only partly closed and sometimes it is lost altogether but while we may dispute about the highest fish there is no doubt about the lowest one this is the lancelot it is of the size and shape of a toothpick translucent scaleless and almost finless burying itself in the sand on warm coasts in almost every region the lancelot has no real bone in it just a line of soft tissue blocking out the space where the backbone ought to be it has no skull nor brain nor eyes nor jaws nor heart nor anything in particular just transparent muscle spinal cord artery gills stomach and ovaries with a fringe of feelers about the slit we call the mouth and even these organs are rather blocked out than developed yet it is easy to see that the creature is a vertebrate in intention and therefore essentially a fish a fish and a vertebrate reduced to their lowest terms you can go fishing almost anywhere 
but whether it is good to do it or not depends on your reasons for doing it there are about three good reasons for going a fishing one indifferent one and one that is wholly bad one good reason is that you may learn to know fish isaac walton tells us that it is good luck to any man to be on the good side of the man that knows fish this is true but you cannot learn to know fish unless you go forth to find them there are about fifteen thousand kinds of fish in the world four thousand of them in north america north of panama now no man knows them all not even on one continent though some have written books upon them but the man who knows a larger part of them has not only learned fish but a host of other things as well he calls to mind rosy spotted trout of the maine woods and still rosier of many brooks of unalaska he has seen the blue parrot fishes of the cuban reefs and the leaping grayling of the gallatin and the eau sable he has tried the incanu of the mackenzie river and the tarpon of the florida reefs he knows the sparkling darters of the french broad and the swananoa the clear-skinned pescados blancos of the chapala lake and the popeyes and grenadiers of three miles drop of bering sea till you learn to know fish you cannot imagine what the water depths still have for you to know the second good reason why you should go a-fishing is that you may know the places where fishes go all the finest scenery is full of fish the firehole canyon the roaring river the agna bonita the rio blanco de orizaba the creek of captain's harbor the serrana the roanoke the restigouche the nipijan and the lakes of the st john all these are good fishing water of their kind so is the rio almandaris the twin lakes and the eagle river the sawtooth mountains the venados islands the shores of clipperton the pearl islands dead man's reef no man's land and the sand reaches of san diego santa barbara pensacola and beaufort if you know all these you know the rest of the united states with canada and mexico as well all this is a goodly country which it is well for a good citizen to understand if you go a-fishing to know the fish the rest will be granted to you and with all the rest you have filled your mind not only with pictures of plunging trout of leaping mascalonge and diving barracuda but you have enriched it with endless vistas of deep green pools of foamy cascades flower-carpeted meadows of dark pines and sunny pines white birch and clinging vines and wallowing mangrove you have dominion over palm and pine the only dominion there is for your dominion doth not speedily pass away you know the crescent bay with its white breakers the rush of the eager waters through the tide-worn estuary the clinging fucus on the rocks at low tide the bark of sea wolves and the roar of sea lions in the long lines of swaying kelp which reach far out into the farthest sea this is good for you to know for it is an antidote to selfishness and doubt and care then too it is good to know the men that live in the open where the fishes are to shake their hands and share their hospitality will cure you of pessimism and distrust of democracy and banish all the chimeras and goblins which vex those who live too long in cities to hear the elk's whistle and the ouzel's call the whir of the grouse's wings and the rush of the water in the canyon will get out of your brain the shriek of cable cars the rattle of the elevated railway and all the unwholesomeness jangle of men who meet to make money so there is a third reason for going a-fishing not so good as the first two but still very noble we may fish for rest or exercise which is but another form of rest we may fish placidly in the placid brooks as walton did for chub and dace till our thoughts flow as placidly as the charles or the suwanee or the thames or we may fish in the rush and roar of the deschute or the buttermilk tramping high through the pines to agua bonita or far across the desert to trapper's lake or struggling through the wooded reaches to the saranac we may come back at night tired enough to lie flat on the floor and drip off the edges of it but withal at peace with all the world it matters not whether we have fish or not there is one reason for fishing which is wholly indifferent that is to go a-fishing for the meat which is in the fish 
this is pan fishing or pot fishing if you get your living by it that is your business it is frequently an honest business but it is not a matter of pride if you caught a hundred trout in the eau sable and ate them all you were fortunate they helped out your store of provisions and trout are very fair eating when properly fried but don't brag about it it interests the rest of us no more than if you boasted of catching ten frogs or eating a hundred chickens in a hundred consecutive days the matter of fish as food belongs to economics or some other dismal science by eating trout or bass you can never get on the good side of the man who knows fish there remains one reason for going fishing which is positively horribly disgustingly bad that is to see how many fish you can catch just for number's sake this is called hog fishing and whether your purpose be to brag over the size of your basket or to lie about the catch or both it is bad bad for the fish bad for the rivers bad for your neighbors bad for you the good man will never slay fish wantonly we creatures of god on the earth together should enjoy each other and the beautiful world which is ours alike because man is the wisest of all with greatest power of knowledge and capacity for happiness it is all the more incumbent on him to preserve the world as fair as he found it and to respect the right so far as may be of every other man and beast end of section seven section eight of nature and art volume eight number one june nineteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. some interesting things about rivers jenkin lloyd jones did the rivers make the valleys or did the valleys make the rivers this is not only an interesting but a very difficult question to answer correctly ask your teachers about it be sure you do not make any mistakes because when you answer it correctly you have found out a great deal about geology and geology is a hard name for a subject that contains many interesting and easy things and the study of the river will help you understand many of these things however it may be about the valleys we are very sure that the river made many many other things that we know about did you ever hear of the orator in the new york legislature who wondered how it was that the rivers most always flowed by the big cities he certainly got his cart before the horse for it is the big cities that always grow by the big rivers history has always grown along the banks of rivers because all civilization has grown along their banks the boundaries of nations change the political maps of europe that i studied when i was a boy are now out of date and you would find they are all wrong because the boundaries of kingdoms states and empires have changed so often but the life of the world continues to be found largely along the banks of the rivers why is this and here is another question for you to talk with your teachers about if you get the answer you will have the key that will let you into much of the wonders and triumphs of art architecture and commerce of course the very earliest man would keep close to the river's edge because he would have no other sure way of getting water to drink and the fish in the water the birds on the water and the birds eggs in the nests along the edge of the river offered him a sure supply of food and then along the river the grass grows greenest and this afforded good grazing for his cows and his horses and maybe his camels what kind of food does the camel like best anyhow primitive man must have learned to swim early and it must have been fun for the little boys of barbarism as it is for the little boys of civilization to plunge into the cooling water on a hot day man must have found out very early 
how to make a raft which would carry him downstream, and soon after he learned how to make a canoe that he could paddle upstream, so the river became his first road. On it he traveled when he went hunting, and with its help he protected his property and that of the tribe. The enemies were driven across the river and kept on the other side. A good way to study what a river does for a man is to find out all you can about the life that gathered about some particular river, for that will tell you more or less of what happened along the banks of all the great rivers. The best of all rivers for such study is the Nile. It is one of the long rivers of the world, so long that its sources have only been recently discovered by those who make geographies. Read the stories of Livingstone and Stanley, and the early explorers who went in search of the headwaters of the Nile. But there are two Niles. One runs through the continent of Africa and empties into the Mediterranean Sea. Another begins in the very earliest dawn of history and runs through the human story of thought, feeling, and life. Along the banks of this Nile, in history, we see how human life was developed, all human life beginning away back there, so far back we cannot count it by years, when man made knives of flints and hatchets of stone. And then, because the Nile gently overflowed its banks two or more times a year, leaving after each freshet a soft layer of fertile mud on either side, primitive man began to plant his seed in this field ploughed by a river, and to raise his millet and peas and beans and some kind of wheat and corn he was able to feed his cattle and to raise chickens and geese along the banks of this river which was only a green ribbon from six to ten miles wide four or five hundred miles long on this green ribbon a great civilization so great and so wonderful that only very learned men can understand how wonderful and how great it was, grew up. Find out something about the pyramids. Look up pictures of the ruins of the temple of Karnak, and that great stone image carved out of a hill, higher than a five-story building, with a head so large that if a man stood on the top of one ear, he could hardly reach the top of the head with his outstretched hand. The Greeks called this great stone image, with the body of a lion and the head of a man, a sphinx. But the Egyptians called it the Horum Ku, or the Horus on the horizon. And Horus was the god-child they most loved, the child of Osiris, the great sun divinity, and of Isis, the beautiful mother of heaven. All this civilization along the Nile would have been impossible had it not been for the Nile. The great stones that went into the pyramids were floated down the river. Soldiers and working men were transported on the river. The fields were made fertile by the river, and the leisure and the wealth that were made possible by the fertile fields on the river's bank gave men time to think and to feel, to invent the beautiful picture writings, to cut out the great tomb temples, and to think the great thoughts of religion, God thoughts, love thoughts, and duty thoughts. Now, what happened along the banks of the Nile happened, to a certain degree, along the banks of the Euphrates and the Tigris. Mesopotamia means the land between the rivers, the mid-river country. Away back five or six thousand years ago, there were people who built great cities, erected high tower temples of burned brick. They invented a curious kind of arrow-headed alphabet, the cuneiform, which they stamped into clay tablets, brick reading books. On the banks of these rivers, in that far-off time, astronomers watched the stars, 
and found out a good deal about the planets and eclipses they measured time by the year of three hundred and sixty-five days and twelve months which means that they had watched the moon and measured the length of the days then there are the other rivers the ganges that runs through the heart of india on the banks of which there grew up the great religions and the curious customs of the hindus and the buddhists and the jordan which you will remember flows through our bible around it clusters the great stories of the prophets of jesus and his disciples when we turn to europe we will find much about the germans by finding out all we can about the rhine if you can find out much about the rhine and the Seine, you will understand the story of france and the french people the thames is older than london and along the banks of the danube grew up nation after nation down that stream have floated war vessels for different peoples for thousands and thousands of years would you not like to see a collection of boats that would reach from the boats made of the raw hides of animals by the early pagan people along the danube up to the latest and best steamer that now plies up and down the great river none the less interesting are the rivers of the western continent the hudson the mississippi and the missouri the ohio and the amazon are the pathways over which the first explorers traveled along their banks did the first settlers make their homes and on their bosom did the men in the wild woods first send their traffics who was it that started the first steamboat up the hudson you remember how abraham lincoln when a boy helped build a flatboat and how he steered that flatboat all the way from illinois to new orleans selling there the truck the early settlers raised exchanging it for molasses and sugar and the calico that they needed in illinois when we remember the great service that the rivers have rendered man the beautiful stories that cluster around them the beautiful life that has sported in their waters floated upon their surface and gathered on their banks is it not a pity that they are being so despoiled by thoughtless and reckless men who wantonly cut down the forests waste the trees that grow up on their banks and then in our cities instead of beautifying the banks and profiting by the scenery foolish men turn the back doors of their houses upon the rivers build barns upon their banks make of them the dumping places into which they throw their rubbish street sweepings and old tin cans everything that will soil the water and spoil the scenery do you not think that some day we will again come back to the old love of the river even if we do not need it so much as a highway now for railroads go faster we will keep them clean and beautiful for the pleasure and the health they yield you have heard of what a dirty thing the Chicago River is, how unpleasant it is both to the sense of sight and to the sense of smell. It is very much the same with many of the other rivers that flow through our great cities and even smaller towns. Some day, the children of our public schools who are now studying these things will grow up and they will find out how to purify our streams they will restore their beauty they will love the fish and the water so much that they will prefer seeing them alive to eating them when dead they will give back the rivers to the birds that will sing unmolested upon their banks and raise their little ones undisturbed in their nests built low among the sedges or swinging loftily in the poplar boughs above so you see my children to know the river is to know much of the geology of the world much of the plant and animal life of the world very much of the history of man and very much of the higher hopes and aspirations the poetry the morality and the religion of the human soul the rivers were here before man was 
they invited man they nursed him they fed him they marked the places for his settlements they helped the organization of the state by the way as a closing lesson suppose you find out how many of the states of our union were named after rivers and see how many of the rivers names you can discover the meaning of for the rivers were on the earth before they were named the names are of men and some of them are very suggestive the rivers are of god they belong to nature and they show forth the laws of nature which are always the laws of god end of section eight Section 9 of Nature and Art, Volume 8, Number 1, June 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. Insects. Some Water Insects. Charles C. Adams. In field and forest, bright-colored and active insects attract our attention. Aquatic insects, on the other hand, do not, as a rule, possess such bright colors as their land relatives, nor move about with as great rapidity, yet it does not follow that they are less interesting. As would be expected, some of the most interesting things about these animals are connected with modifications of their form which have resulted from their aquatic life. It is believed that the ancestors of water insects have been land insects, which invaded the water and have thus become greatly modified in their new surroundings. Locomotion and breathing, either one or both of these functions, are as a rule very different in land and water insects. The variety of aquatic insects, if we consider only the adults, is not great when compared with the land insects. But when we compare fresh and salt water forms, it is surprising how few kinds there are which live in the sea in spite of its vast area and great food supply. So few are the insects found in the sea, or other salt waters, that to most of us to speak of aquatic insects only calls to mind freshwater forms. We shall therefore refer almost wholly to freshwater forms. Let us consider briefly a few examples of these. We may distinguish two general groups according to their special habitat. Belonging to the first group are those insects which frequent primarily the surface of the water. These forms, which breathe air directly and not air dissolved in water, as in the case with many other water insects, must be kept dry and be able to maintain their position on the surface of the water. Surface insects, such as the water skaters, found on quiet ponds and streams, and their marine relatives, holobates, accomplish this by means of fine hairs which cover the feet where they touch the water. The same physical principle is involved here as when a needle or wire is floated upon water, that of surface tension. The fine hairs on the body of a water insect act in the same way as those on the feet and thus keep the insect dry when below the surface. These insects are thus able to breathe as land insects on account of their being on the surface and consequently their respiratory systems are not as greatly modified as in many of the insects living beneath the surface. It must be borne in mind that an insect breathes by means of the air which enters the body by small openings and is led by means of tubes which become very finely divided like veins to all parts of the body. By means of contractions and expansions of the body of the insect, the air within these tubes is caused to circulate and thus impure air is driven out and a fresh supply is pumped in. Two of the commonest of these surface dwellers so well known to the small boy who frequents ponds and streams are the whirligig beetles or lucky bugs and the long-legged water striders or water skaters. The whirligig beetles are easy to recognize on account of their characteristic circular gyrations when disturbed 
and by their habit of associating in large numbers in quiet places. When one of these groups is disturbed, they exhibit such activity that they well deserve their name, crazy bugs. The eyes of these beetles are very peculiar in that each eye is divided into an upper and lower part. Thus, the insect has practically an upper and lower pair, one adapted for sight at the surface and the other for vision under water. The whirligigs do not seem to be very particular about their food, as they will accept both live and dead insects which fall into the water, and even under some circumstances will feed upon plants. When a beetle plunges beneath the surface, as he often does when frightened, he carries down a small bubble of air between the ends of his horny wings and the tip of his body. On account of his body being lighter than water, it takes some effort to dive, but none to rise to the surface. The two hind pairs of legs, which are used so much in swimming, are very much flattened and plate-like, making excellent paddles, as is shown by their exceedingly rapid movements. The water skaters, or striders, prefer quiet waters as do whirligigs, but do not have the decided social disposition shown in the latter to such a marked degree. These skaters, on account of their long legs and short bodies, are the daddy long legs of the water. These characteristics and their habitat make them easy to recognize. They are nervous, active insects in their movements, jumping and skimming about on the surface with but little show of grace and ease as compared with the ordinary graceful curves of the whirligigs. Their food habits are very similar to those of other surface insects, that is, dead and dying insects found floating on the water, but their method of taking food is quite different from that of the whirligigs, because of the great difference in the structure of their mouth parts. The whirligig, being a beetle, has the typical biting mouth parts, while the strider has a slender beak or proboscis, by means of which it sucks the juices from its prey, as do other bugs. The four legs are used to seize the prey and bring it within reach of the beak. The middle and hind pair are used for rowing over the surface, the latter pair primarily for steerage, the fine hairs on the legs making it possible, as mentioned before, to make use of the surface tension. Large dimples are formed on the surface of the water where the feet touch it. One would hardly expect it possible for an insect standing on the surface of water to get its feet dirty, yet the great care which they give to cleaning their feet clearly shows that dirt is of common occurrence, even there. The white or grey colour on the lower side of the body is due to the reflection of light from minute hairs which cover the surface and keep the insect dry, even when submerged. The marine relatives of our striders have some curious habits. Some of them live out at sea hundreds of miles from land where they are thought to feed upon the dead bodies of small animals. When the surface of the sea is calm, they glide in colonies quickly over the surface, showing great skill in diving, but if the sea begins to become agitated, they immediately disappear from the surface. Perhaps the most remarkable habit which a surface insect has, is that possessed by some of the allies of the skaters, which not only swim in the water, but actually run on the underside of the surface film. It would be very interesting to know how such a habit was acquired. Another interesting group of insects are those which breathe air as the surface film insects, yet seek their food below the surface. These insects are compelled, on account of their air-breathing habits, to repeatedly visit the surface or communicate in some way with a fresh supply of air. We have two families of the large-sized water beetles, common in our ponds and streams, the predaceous water beetles and the water scavenger beetles. These are easily recognized because in the former the antennae are thread-like and not enlarged at the tip while the members of the water scavenger family have the antennae 
enlarged or club-shaped at the tip. The predaceous water beetles are often quite common under electric lights, where they have been attracted by the intense light. Their large size and clumsy movements when out of water attract attention, but when seen in water their skill as swimmers is in striking contrast to their awkward movements made on land. The hind legs are flattened and very powerful, the surface being increased by a fringe of strong hairs on the inner side. In swimming, the stroke is made by both legs at once. Perhaps the most interesting facts about these beetles are those associated with their method of breathing. The horny wing cases covering the abdomen are very thick and fit close against the abdomen except at the extreme posterior end of the body. The space between the wing cases and the upper surface of the abdomen forms a large air space. The spiracles, or openings, into the respiratory system are situated at the margins of the upper side of the abdomen. When the beetle comes to the surface for a fresh supply of air, it exposes the tip of the body and then, by a depression of the tip of the abdomen, allows a fresh supply of air to enter into the cavity below the wing covers. This cavity is then closed and the beetle is ready for another trip under the water. When resting in the water, they float with their head downward and the end of the abdomen slightly projecting from the water, thus a fresh supply of air is easy to secure. In their food habits, these beetles are predaceous and, in addition to other insects, will even kill small fish. The water scavenger beetles are not such perfect swimmers as the predaceous ones. When the latter makes a stroke in swimming, it strikes with both hind legs, while the scavengers strike alternatingly with the hind legs. Their method of securing and carrying air, as with other water beetles, is remarkable. In addition to their air reservoir under the wings, they have on the underside of the body large hairy areas, which communicate with the one under the wings. All the air spaces are thus in direct communication. The respiratory openings in the predaceous water beetles open to the upper side of the abdomen, but in these beetles they are on the lower side and surrounded by short hairs which preserve the air film on the lower surface. When the fresh air supply has been exhausted, the beetle comes to the surface, tips the body slightly so as to bring the region on one side of the body just behind the head to the surface. The long antenna which is folded backward and reaches to the rear part of the head, occupies an air space in its apical half, and in addition is covered by fine hairs, thus being doubly protected from being wetted. At the moment the beetle reaches the surface, by a stroke of the antenna, on the side which is nearest the surface, the body being tilted, the film from the air space in which the antenna rests is carried upward and outward to the surface of the water, thus forming an opening to the exterior. By movements of the wings, aided by bellows-like contractions and expansions of the body, a fresh supply of air is pumped into the air reservoir. In speaking of peculiar water insects, one must not forget to mention the larva of Donatia. The adult female of this interesting leaf-eating beetle often cuts circular holes in the large leaves of water lilies and then deposits her eggs at the margin of these holes on the underside. When the larvae hatch, they make their way to the roots upon which they feed. The really remarkable thing about this larva is how it gets its air supply, as it does not have gills, nor is it known to visit the surface for a fresh supply of air, and yet it has a normal air-breathing system. On the dorsal surface, near the tail end of the body, are two slender, curved, spine-like processes. The air tubes of the body arise from the base of these spines, and spiracular-like openings are found at their base. Two different views have been advocated to explain how it is possible for the larva to secure air. 
there seems to be no difference of opinion with regard to the source of the air supply from the air cells in the root of the plant upon which the larva feeds one view is that these air spaces in the plant are punctured by the spines and thus the air is taken directly into the air tubes the other view is that the larva bites a hole into the air space and then by the aid of the spines holds the openings at the base of the spine against the air space and thus the air is taken up the back swimmers are curious little fellows which swim upside down in the water and by means of their sucking mouth parts prey upon other small animals the lightness of their bodies and the large amount of air which they carry with them make it necessary when they wish to remain below the surface to hold fast to some object thus it takes constant effort in order to remain below the surface for this reason it is quite natural that they should very often be found floating at the surface where no effort is needed to maintain their position and where an abundant supply of air is accessible another method of securing fresh air but differing from that of any of the insects previously mentioned is by means of elongated breathing tubes thus allowing the insect to remain submerged and yet secure a fresh supply of air from the surface this method is used by some predaceous water bugs as shown in the plate ranatra fusca as with all of our predaceous water bugs which have the elongated respiratory tube at the end of the body water scorpion has its forelegs adapted for capturing and holding its prey which consists generally of small fish and insects the apical part of the fore leg folds back on the basal part which is grooved on its inner surface as a knife blade folds into its handle as the slender legs of this bug would indicate it is not an active swimmer but crawls about slowly doubtless the best known to most people of this type of breather are the giant water bugs which accumulate in such large numbers under and in the globes of electric lights the paired nature of the breathing tube is well shown in the plate these bugs are powerful swimmers as is shown by their flattened hind legs even young fish are not overlooked by these voracious bugs a south american kind is much larger than our species reaching from four to four and one half inches in length or about twice the size of our species the shortness of the air tube suggests that this organ is not used in just the same manner as in the water scorpions and the areas of fine hairs on the underside of the body suggest that these insects may be somewhat of a compromise between those insects which carry air below with them and those which remain submerged except for the tube which communicates with the air most of the insects previously mentioned are ones which throughout life live in water but a very large number are aquatic only during their larval or immature stages the mosquito is a good illustration of this type in some of its habits the mosquito is well known but this is primarily due to the biting habit of the female the researches of recent years clearly show that the annoyance from the bite itself is, in the case of some kinds of mosquitoes, only a small part of the mischief that they can do. The life history of the mosquito has been summarized somewhat as follows by Dr. L. O. Howard. The eggs are laid at night in a boat-shaped mass containing from 200 to 400 eggs these may hatch in sixteen hours the larval stage lasting about a week and the pupal stage about twenty-four hours thus the entire cycle may be completed in ten days under favorable circumstances but may be greatly delayed by a low temperature the rapidity with which the complete cycle can be passed through makes it possible for a very large number of broods to occur during a single season the wigglers or wiggle tails often so numerous in rain barrels are the larvae of mosquitoes every one has noticed that these larvae when not disturbed rest at the surface but when frightened drop slowly downward in the water since they are heavier than this medium yet they rest at the surface by means of a rosette of thin plates at the tail end of the body these 
act as the hairs on the legs of the water strider and make use of the tension of the surface film which holds the lava up as the surface tension held up the water strider on the next to the last segment of the wiggler there is a large breathing tube which reaches to the surface when the lava is floating the food of the lava is said to be decaying vegetable matter the short pupil period is also past floating but it now has two breathing tubes near the points of attachment of the wings when ready to transform it crawls out onto the pupil skin and dries its wings preparatory to flight our common mosquitoes belong to three genera culex anopheles and corethra the annoyance caused by the irritation resulting from the bite is not understood as no poison gland has been found the females only of our mosquitoes are known to suck blood from researches made during the past few years it is now definitely known that the bite of certain kinds of mosquitoes is really dangerous this is not on account of the actual puncture made by the insect but due to the presence of the germs of malaria which are introduced into the wound from the infected insect the only mosquitoes which are definitely known to transmit this malarial parasite to man belong to the genus anopheles the malarial parasite thus has two hosts mosquitoes belonging to the genus anopheles and man this parasite infests the stomach walls of the mosquito where it rapidly multiplies and becomes mature then escaping from this locality accumulates in the salivary glands from this reservoir they are easily transferred to their human host at the time of sucking blood these aquatic insects which we have discussed so briefly are only a few samples from a very large number whose history and habits are full of interest to those who find the study of animal life a fascinating subject End of section 9section 10 of nature and art volume 8 number 1 june 1900 read for librivox.org by tavarish insect music the peculiar sounds made by different insects though usually known as insect music are probably far from musical in the opinions of those who listen to it with dread many superstitious people have firm belief in dire warnings concerning certain calamities which insect music portends for instance we are told that the death watch is a popular name applied to certain beetles which bore into the walls and floors of old houses they make a ticking sound by standing on their hind legs and knocking their heads against the wood quickly and forcibly many superstitions have been entertained respecting the noise produced by these insects which is sometimes imagined to be a warning of death there are many insects however which produce sound decidedly musical and many such instances have been enumerated everybody is familiar with the music of the katydid here it is the male that has the voice at the base of each wing cover is a thin membranous plate he elevates the wing covers and rubs the two plates together if you could rub your shoulder blades together you could imitate the operation very nicely certain grasshoppers make a sound when flying that is like a watchman's rattle clackety clack very rapidly repeated there are also some moths and butterflies which have voices the death's head moth makes a noise when frightened that strikingly resembles the crying of a young baby how it is produced is not known though volumes have been written on the subject the morning cloak butterfly a dark species with a light border on its wings makes a cry of alarm by rubbing its wings together. The katydids, crickets, grasshoppers, and other musical insects are all exaggerated in the tropics, assuming giant form. 
thus their cries are proportionately louder there is an east indian cicada which makes a remarkably loud noise it is called by the natives dundab which means drum from this name comes that of the genus which is known as dundubia this is one of the few scientific terms from sanskrit entomologists have succeeded in recording the cries of many insects by the ordinary system of musical notation but this method does not show the actual pitch which is usually several octaves above the staff it merely serves to express the musical intervals it is known with reasonable certainty that many insects have voices so highly pitched that they cannot be heard with the human ear one evidence of this fact is that some people can distinguish cries of insects which are not audible to others but even if there are a few notes lost to many of us there is enough insect music to prove vastly entertaining to those who take interest in the insect world and the peculiar methods of its inhabitants in communicating with each other. End of section 10. This recording is in the public domain. Section 11 of Nature and Art, Volume 8, Number 1, June 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Domestic Animals Cattle Cattle is a term applied to the whole of that large variety of domestic animals known as the bovine family. Naturalists have divided them into two primary groups, the hump-backed cattle, Bos indicus, and the straight-backed cattle, Bos taurus some naturalists claim that these two groups are really only different varieties of the same species while others claim that the marked differences in structure habits and voice are such as would indicate a specific distinction the humpbacked variety is chiefly found in india and africa while the straight-backed cattle are common in all parts of the globe cattle seem to have been domesticated as far back as written and traditional history will take us the remains of the cow and the ox have been found as a part of the many evidences of the oldest civilizations their bones having been discovered in the same caves with stone axes and stone knives that the cow contributed immensely to the earlier civilizations cannot be doubted besides contributing to the daily bill of fare she became the common beast of burden drawing the rudest of ploughs sleds and carts and in fact she does the same today to some extent in many parts of the world the common straight-back cattle as we know them in our country remain an important factor even in this stage of civilization while they are not generally used as beasts of burden they furnish millions of gallons of milk and numberless pounds of butter and finally sacrificing their entire bodies to the use of man the principal part of the body goes to the meat block to become steaks roasts and soup bones the refuse flesh going to the manufacture of soaps largely the hide furnishes most of our leather the bones become fertilizer the hoofs and horns make our glue and lastly the hair makes it possible for us to live in plastered houses in olden times a man's wealth seems to have been measured by the number of cattle he owned and during the same period cattle were used as money or a medium of exchange later when metal coinage came into use in greece the image of an ox was stamped on the new money in commemoration of the old system the same idea has left its impression on the languages of europe as seen in the latin word pecunia and the english word pecuniary both words being derived from pecus cattle america is the great cattle producing country of the world in the early settlement of this country the immense tracts of uncultivated grasslands were well adapted to cattle raising and many were the large herds to be seen west of the ohio river on the great prairies of the country 
once known as the northwest territory but as men came with their plows the herds were gradually driven farther and farther west cattle are very interesting animals when we once get acquainted with them the writer when a boy had some experience herding cattle on an illinois prairie in this particular herd of which i wish to speak there were about seven hundred head and it required two of us and also two good shepherd dogs to keep them in control during the early part of the herding season or until we got them broken in as the old herders used to say these cattle had been wintered on various farms surrounding the herd grounds so when they were brought together in the spring there were about fifteen different clans to contend with each clan having its recognized leader now these leaders are always a source of trouble to the herder and especially is this true for the first few weeks after bringing them together the whole herd would be grazing and moving slowly along seemingly perfectly satisfied when suddenly one of those leaders would raise his head very high in the air and act as if he saw something very interesting a mile away and would immediately start off in a rapid walk bellowing two or three times to notify his followers that he was out for a stroll then the whole of his clan would follow him at once they would not go far until the leader would set the pace in a rapid trot but we always had the remedy at hand for these fellows and immediately one of us would mount a horse and taking a dog make a straight run for the leader and begin to give him the business end of a long heavy whip the horse being trained to this sort of performance would keep close to this leader allowing us to pour on the whip until he was so completely run down and fagged out generally that he would never aspire to that office again in fact he would lose all interest in cattle politics not even making a good follower thereafter but other leaders would spring up and have to be discouraged in the same manner while these clan leaders gave us more or less trouble during the whole of the season and made it necessary to exercise vigilance it did not have in it that source of danger and excitement that we experienced in a general stampede we had two of these during this season one of which turned out rather seriously and furnished enough excitement to have satisfied the most reckless boy in our vicinity it was some time the last of the month of may we had rounded up our cattle in the evening as usual putting them in the pound for the night our cabin was near the pound and situated on higher ground so we could overlook the entire herd this pound had an area of about ten acres being enclosed by a very strong wooden fence it was some time after midnight when we were awakened by the approach of a terrific thunderstorm we knew the danger of a stampede during these storms and immediately got up dressed ourselves in our rubber clothes went to the stable a few yards away and saddled our horses we were then ready for any emergency when the lightning flashed we could see the cattle walking in a circle round and round the pound soon the rain began to pour down in torrents and the storm was on in earnest it had not been raining long when with a blinding flash the lightning struck a tree just outside the pound the shock was so great that it knocked down a number of the cattle which we saw regaining their feet during the next flash of lightning with one mighty surge the cattle mashed down the entire fence on one side of the pound and the stampede was on we had our horses out in a jiffy and calling the dogs we started in hot pursuit all we dared to do was to follow there were quite a number of trees in the path they took for about eighty rods from the pound the almost continuous lightning enabled us to follow the cattle they were running at full speed and it sounded like distant thunder and fairly shook the earth they ran about a mile when they came to a small lake which caused them to separate into two distinct herds i followed one herd and my companion the other after running about four miles and through a large farm they finally stopped in some heavy timber i had not long to wait until daylight and the storm being over i rounded up all i could find and started them back toward the herd grounds arriving at the cabin about eleven a m my companion arriving about the same time after a hurried meal we went out to look for injured cattle and to make a count we found two dead ones near the pound 
which had evidently lost their lives by running against trees it was several days before we were able to locate all the stragglers end of section eleven